Welcome back to the Dharma. Uh, right now, uh, I'd like to welcome back a very, very special woman who was at Boom Festival last year as one of the wisdom keepers and attended uh, in many ways uh, in the festival in uh, lots of activities. The opening, you were there <laughs> and uh, shared your, uh, your beautiful knowledge from the north uh, of Europe. And we are very, very happy to have you back. I know you will be also at the Sacred Fire doing the rituals in the morning. Yep, at nine o'clock every morning if anybody's yes. up, come and join us. Yes, and uh, very, very special. And it's amazing that you're going to talk here at the Dharma. So uh, please, ladies and gentlemen, this will be the talk, uh, Walk About Pilgrimage and the Healing Act of Walking the Land by Angert Wynn. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lex. So my name's Ang Haradway. I'm going to leave it up there for as long as possible because I don't often get to have my name up in lights. It's perhaps the only time I'll, I'll get to do it. I want to talk to you about walking the land. Um, I've been walking since uh, a very little girl, like most of us will have been doing. But very early on, when I was about seven or eight, um, I started to take long walks. I used to, I used to go out with a neighbour of ours, actually. My father was uh, quite disabled, so he couldn't take me out, so he sent me off with a neighbour. And we would walk for many, many miles, and there would be a group of us, usually, and somebody at lunchtime would start to tell the stories of the places that we walked. And as I grew, I started to take my friends out on these walks. And I noticed that something really interesting would happen to people when we went out and did walks like that. And I started to query it until I started to connect it with the idea of songlines, the Aboriginal songlines, and what was happening there. And I decided that one of the things I really wanted to do was to find the songlines of Northern Europe, more specifically to begin with, because Northern Europe is quite a big space, to find the songlines of Wales, uh, the, the country that I come from, which is part of the United Kingdom, and, and Britain as well, and try and trace them and try and find through that a way back to our dreaming. But that journey in itself took me on another journey of helping people come back to their humanity. And that's what I want to share with you this afternoon, is a little bit about that process and a little bit about how walking and spending time out in the wilds is so very, very important to who we are as a species. So the idea of, of going for a walk, for a recreational walk, is actually quite a modern idea. Until the Industrial Revolution, it was just a way of getting about. But when the Industrial Revolution came and we started to live in cities and industrial areas, more and more human beings felt an urge to escape and to go out into wilderness. And this idea of going for a walk began. But of course, walking itself is much, much older. Walking across the land is probably as old as our species itself. The earliest humans we know uh, both climbed trees, were adapted to climb trees and walk. Around about between six and three million years ago, one of our ancestors, who was fairly much like a monkey, started to stand on two feet. And while we can know the science and we can see from kind of fossilized bones that this happened and what that caused for us in terms of our physicality, nobody really can tell us uh, why. But m what anthropologists believe it, that it was something to do with curiosity. Something to do also probably with... Um, survival. It may be that we started living on planes and to be able to stand on our two feet enabled us to see further and to therefore keep ourselves safe, check that there wasn't anything that was going to eat us out there on the plains. But something really profound happened. Once we started to stand on our feet, we got even more curious about what was further and further and further afield. 
Walking came from Africa around about six million years ago. And humanity then walked itself along pathways that it found all across the world. That's how we spread, essentially, was on our two feet. And something happened to our brain. Something about being on two feet, because we are the only species that does that. We're the only animal species on the planet that gets up on two feet and walks predominantly that way. Something happened in our brain and we walked ourselves towards humanity. Something about the curiosity and something about the nature of what happened to us, what we saw, what we were able to do, because suddenly we had two hands free from having to walk on the floor to use tools. And that stimulated our brains further. Over many thousands of years, our upright ancestors then began to explore and connect different places on their two feet. They would go to places where they might find stone or flint for tools, and then they might go and walk to somewhere where they would uh, be able to find a good crop of berries. And then along the way somewhere, they found what they must have seen as special places. Places that they purposely set apart from ordinary places where they might get water or might get food. And our ancestors were nomadic. They walked from place to place to place to place. In fact, if we split the six million years or so that we have been walking into the average lifespan of a human being, say 60 years, we have been nomadic up until a bit of the last second. It's only in a bit of the last second that we discovered farming and ended up staying in one place. Until then, for all of that time of humanity, we have walked and created paths. And as our ancestors created paths, they handed those pathways down from generation to generation. And they handed the stories, they, they made stories about those places. And the stories and the songs became maps, ways of finding their way across landscape. And when they found sacred places, they not only marked them out as sacred, but they began over time, about 40,000 years ago, to decorate them, to leave their mark on those places. Across Northern Europe, we have amazing cave paintings and cave engravings or in rock shelters, the Vazaire Valley in France. Um, there are over 600 cave paintings dating from about 15,000 years BC. This is uh, what you see behind me is one such example. Now these caves were sacred places. They weren't kind of used for um, habitat. They were too cold and too wet most of the time. And we know from the finds that archaeologists find that they weren't using them as settlement sites. They were going in and marking these as very special sacred places where they would maybe show the dreaming of what they were connecting to in that landscape. Our ancestors, they created these paths from place to place, from places of gathering stone or gathering berries or going to these sacred places and they left as well as the stories that they 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 drew out of the land there they also left their own imprints along that land and I believe that that those stories and those memories are there for us all to pick up more than any other um, peoples now alive it's the it's the Aboriginal Australians that have, have retained the memory of how to do this they still use what they call the song lines and the, of the dreaming and the, of the stories of the dreaming and the songs of the dreaming to navigate their way across vast tracts of desert that seem to have very little um, landmarks to show you where to go. But by singing these stories and going to visit these places and doing ceremony in these places, they manage to maintain a balance between the landscape and their own humanity. And it's a very, very important 
thing for them to do. As people who are hunter-gatherers, as our ancestors would have been, keeping that balance between humanity and the spiritual world and the and place is an incredibly important thing because you rely on it. Because we became farmers, we really needed to rely on that kind of knowledge less. And so we've lost a lot of that, but we can still find it in, in the dreaming and the, the song lines of the Aboriginal peoples of Australia. Narrative and landscape then are inextricably linked. Anywhere in the world where people have walked, where there's traces of people, the land has kind of exchanged stories with them. And we've added our own stories along the way. And it doesn't have to be just in Australia that you can find these. I've spent the last 10, 15 years finding them through linking archaeological sites and mythological sites. They are all around us. They will be here in Portugal. They will be in any bit of landscape on your, uh, out of your back door. So I'd, you know, please go out and have a look and see what you can find yourself. As humans, we've always sensed a connection with landscapes. Abra um, the anthropologists believe that before we could actually read books, we would read the stories in the landscape, that we would read them almost like books. We have a bond with the land and a deep understanding that if it's severed, it really undermines who we are. It does something to our spirituality, to our humanity, which is detrimental. Our people have marked landscape as sacred all the way back from the Neolithic since they started to, 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 to develop a relationship with it all across the world. There's examples here from Aboriginal Australia showing the, the map of the dream time and uh, some of the song lines. An example here from Portugal. Uh, an example from Britain. This one, the last one of the horse. An area of the chalk downs in Britain where we believe there were many horse stories, maybe a totemic belief in the, in, the, in the power of the horse as animal. And if we scratch the surface, those stories are still there somewhere in the mists of time. This is a picture from India. I go out to India in, in the autumn every year to work with some of the, the tribal groups in Rajasthan. And there's an amazing fortress there called the Maranga Fort. And when I first went there, I was amazed because I would see women, especially the older women, going up into uh, different parts of the Maranga Fort. There are these friezes with these earthenware hands that you can see in that image. And these women would go up to them and touch them. And I was curious. I was curious to know why they were doing that, what they were connecting to. And so I asked. And they explained to me that these were the handprints of the Sati women. They would have been the, um, the wives or the concubines of the, the kings, the Mughal kings. And it was tradition at the time that when the king died, certain women of the royal household would choose to throw themselves on the death pyre as well. It was a way of keeping the bloodline pure. It was a way of, it was retaining honor it's a horrible thought for us today but it was a it was a considered um almost like a saintly act for for those of us in the, in the western world we might understand sainthood in a in, in that way but the sarties of any area are still remembered and what these hands are are kind of the the imprints not the imprints exactly but a symbol of the handprint of the Sati, because the last thing that she would do as she would follow the funeral cortege of her husband or, or uh, the king would be to press her hand to the wall of the fortress and leave her memories, leave the memory of her life there for other people to pick up. And what these women were doing, touching these, was connecting to the stories that these other women hundreds of years ago had left in that place. Because in the Western world, it might seem quite an odd thing for us to think that if you go out there and touch the land, that it can speak its stories to you. But for most of the world, there is an absolute belief that rocks 
and stones and, and, and the landscape retain the stories, that you can place stories in them and you can draw them out again. And for me, when I was hearing this, it just fed into what I thought was happening when people go out into the landscape and start to connect really deeply with them. So to go back to that span of human evolution then, if we've only stopped being nomadic and come to live in one place for less than a thousandth of, of, a, of a second if you split it from a 60-year lifespan, in a fraction of that time, We've gone from living on the land and inextricably, inextricably bound to it and reliant on it to living in boxes where the elements are kept outside and we remain inside. We have separated ourselves entirely in this last nanosecond of humanity from all we have known, all that has supported our evolution for the last six million years and it's having a really detrimental effect on us we're doing crazy things like spending a lot of money going to exercise in the gym instead of working on the land or going out for a walk and it's having a really detrimental health it's not just about becoming sedentary lifestyles and becoming obese we're more drugged up than ever before we're more, uh, we're, we're more inclined to pollute our world. We're more inclined to eat food that is polluted and pollute ourselves. We're more out of our minds. We're more sick. We're cruel to each other. We're cruel to the animals that share this planet with us. We're disconnected from us, each other, even in families. We're kind of glued to to these things instead of having conversations. We inject ourselves and put ourselves through tortuous processes in order to look better and feel better about ourselves. And we go and exercise in boxes away from nature. More than that, we've stopped thinking independently. And there's quite a sinister thing going on here because mass culture doesn't encourage individuality and so in a way mass culture keeps us doing this thing what it doesn't want us to do is to go out there and take risks and find our own individuality our own limits and, and push the boundaries because it doesn't do well insurance companies don't make money from us if we are happy to take risks if we're risk averse they can make money from us. If the mass culture out there, if the leaders can rule us by making us afraid and keeping us afraid, we're far more manageable. They can get us to do what we want. So one of the most radical things that we can do is to actually get out there and get wild, is to rewild ourselves by taking some risks, by finding our own boundaries and by bringing that back into our own lives. Things have gone wrong. Things are going wrong out there. Outside this bubble of the boomlands, you will each of you go back to a life which involves work and cities and things and you can see that humanity is not doing so great in the Western world. There's lots of problems. But my thinking is if we walked our way to humanity, we can start by walking ourselves back to it, by taking that radical act of going out and reclaiming our wild spaces, reclaiming our wild selves. Interestingly, just as humanity is kind of is struggling, there is something in us, even though we can be very self-destructive, there's something in humanity which is a, a self-saving thing as well, an instinct for survival. And this picture here is of uh, a pilgrim on the route to Santiago de Compostela. Now, in 1985, only 2,050 odd, 2,500 odd people did the Compostela route. By 2010, that had increased to 
270,000. Something's happening. People are looking to leave their everyday lives and take some kind of a spiritual journey onto feet again. And that's a really important and profound thing. It's not just happening at, at Santiago de Compostela, it's happening all over the world. Leaving the ordinary behind to contemplate spirit, to contemplate ourselves, to reconnect with ourselves, and to reconnect with other humans along the way, and find a simpler way of being, a more fundamental way of being, is something that more and more of us are compelled to doing. Now, in an age where we no longer initiate our young, well, certainly not here in the Western world, finding a way to challenge ourselves is something really important. It's a really important part of, of growing up and finding our own limits and finding our own possibilities because they're far, our, our boundaries, our possibilities are generally far broader than we think they are. And you don't have to be on a spiritual path or a, a religious path to go on pilgrimage. One of the things I've been doing over the last 10 years is taking people out on spiritual pilgrimages where we connect ancestral places, um, archaeological spaces, stories, mythology in the landscape. But you can do it yourself. You don't need somebody like me to take you on a walk. It's all there for you to do. And it's a life-changing thing. To spend a few days, maybe even a few weeks, just walking, walking yourself back to yourself is a truly profound and life-enhancing thing. Now, the title of this talk is Walkabout, and I just want to kind of mention that Walkabout is actually a very spe specific thing. It, again, comes from the um, Aboriginal culture, and it's the process whereby young men, generally, of about 14 years old, are taken out and go walking into the landscape for up to six months in order to take themselves to the edges of themselves in order that they find their own path and find their who they are and start to grow into that sense of manhood. Aboriginal and kind of uh, traditional cultures are very, very keen to develop the individual's gifts, different from mass culture that we live in. And that's why it's really important for them to initiate their young people. We don't have an initiatory system, unless you're very lucky to be working with somebody specific or from a very minority culture. It's unlikely in the West that you'll be put through an initiatory culture. But there are things that you can do for yourself. And I would suggest that going on walks, pilgrimages, um, uh, um, all sorts of things like shamanic practice of going out on, on long journeys and, and vision quests are all things that we can do for ourselves and they really test our limitations. But it's rare for us in the modern world to have six months so we have to find a way of doing it in shorter chunks. We can allow our legs and our feet to be our guide. We don't need anybody else to do it. It can be as easy as buying a map, taking some time, packing a rucksack and going off. And to dream into the landscape, to slow down to a soul's pace is a, very, is a really great first stop. There's a lovely um, saying, Arabic saying, that the soul can only travel at a camel's pace. So I'm always thinking that when I travel, especially by air, you know, my soul isn't going to catch up with me for another fortnight at least here. And by that time, I'm going to be back. And it can feel very disjointed when you're traveling quickly from one place, place to another. When you slow down and walk in a landscape, you catch up with yourself. You catch up with your soul. And you start to be able to connect with that landscape and dream into it. Now, journeys and walking, they're such a big part of who we are as human beings that they've become embedded in our language, in the metaphors that we use. We use the word journey to describe somebody's, the arc of somebody's life. We talk about choosing a path in life, going all the way. All these things, and that's just in the English language, I'm sure that your own languages will have similar things. The idea of, 
of walking. We've been doing it for such a long time that it's become a way of describing things. If we sow to the soul's pace, it can become like a macrocosm, a microcosm of life for us. In that one journey, we can find the beauty in the grain of sand. We can do all that William Blake is talking about there. What does he say? To see a world in the grain of sand and heaven in a wild flower. Hold infinity in the palm of your hand and, uh, and destiny in an hour. And that's what it does when you slow yourself down in that way. When we start to think of the land that we walk on as holy, then what, when we walk across it, it becomes a divine and ritual act. It becomes a sacred act, even though we might not be doing it for, for sacred reasons. Walking can become a, an act of deep healing. It's an opportunity to, create, to connect to creation and to ourselves. It's about finding the mythos in the moment, the poetry in the moment. I've been taking kind of groups of women and last week I took a, a group of 12 people from across the world out into the mountains in Snowdonia near where I live and it always astonishes me the impact that it has. People feel better very quickly. One of the, the young men, he's only 32 I think who was with us last week, he said to me at the end of the walk, he said I almost didn't come. The night before I almost called and said I can't come because I was feeling so ill. I've been suffering from anxiety. And this is a young man who has a steady job, he's got a steady girlfriend, everything in his life seems great. But it's living at such a, a wild, frantic, fast pace that he'd got really bad panic attacks. And I didn't know about this when he came. And I, when he told me this, I said, well, you know, why didn't you tell me? And he said, well, I, the thing is, by the time we started walking, there was no need because it had all gone, gone away. Something about the landscape, something about slowing down, about being in beautiful wilderness suddenly put life back into perspective. And that's what I've seen happening time and time again. A journey can become an invitation to a conversation. If we believe that um, fundamentally landscape and walking on it is about that relationship, about dreaming, about perceiving what is there for us and connecting with our humanity, it can become a conversation. I want to share with you now a very personal journey that I made last year. Back in the spring of last year, um, I was diagnosed with a large cyst on my ovary, on my right ovary, and it was about six or seven centimeters across, and they didn't like the look of it from the scan, and the, the consultant said, we're fairly certain it's cancer. And for a, somebody who's a mother of a 13-year-old, that's not a great prognosis. It was a bit of a shock, and uh, it, things didn't look good for a while. One of the things I knew that I needed to do in order to kind of just manage how I dealt with this was to go out into the wild. It's a bit of my default thing to do is to go out and walk. And there was a place that I wanted to go to. I'd seen it on a map, um, an OS map, and I'd always been fascinated by it. It's called Llyn Lloyr, which that's the Welsh, uh, the language that I speak, and we have these great things called OS maps, Ordnance Survey maps in the UK. You can read them, they're fantastic, they're like, they're like books, because the, the place names, um, because they're in, in Wales, a lot of them in the Welsh language, they hold so much information about what is there and what these places were used for. And Llyn Lloer means the lake of the moon, and it was held in a valley called uh, the Valley of the Moon. And I thought, well, I've been wanting to go to this place for a long time. This sounds like the time to go. The only place is going to be a woman's healing place. That's it. So I looked at the map, and I don't know if you can see, but I've drawn a, a line. The, the red line going up there is 
a ridge called Pen yr Olewen. And the, the little kind of lines uh, around there show you how steep it is. I knew it was going to be steep, but it doesn't give you a lot of information about the terrain. So slightly haphazardly, I just kind of thought, it'll be fine. And um, I have a collie dog who doesn't have thumbs, so rock climbing is not a good option. But we set off. And I plotted a route. I know I wanted to go up Penarole Wen and then walk the ridge over to Cavanet Llewellyn and then find my way down to this lake and the Valley of the Moon. That's what I wanted to do. And in doing that, somehow I just thought it would be really ha helpful for me to, to process what I'd just been told. So off we went. And when we got there, I parked the car and that's the first thing I saw. I thought, oh, okay, it's a bit steeper than I expected. Yeah, it's probably a path. It shows that there's a path on the map. It'll be fine. So my colleague and I, we set off, and there was a path to begin with. And after about 100 meters, the path disappeared. There was just no path until it got to that kind of thing, all these jagged rocks. And there was just this voice in my head that says, the path is still there, even though you can't see it. The path is still there, even though you can't see it. And there was something just very profound about having to trust that at that point and to keep going. And so we did, we kept going. And then the path <laughs> became this Free slope. Now, when I was about 12, I slipped down. It's just like slate and shale, and it, you walk on it, and it just kind of disappears underneath your feet and rolls down. And I fell about 10 meters when I was when I was about 10 years old, and it's my most hated thing. If you want to see me turn to jelly, I'm fairly fearless, but show me a scree slope, and my legs start to go. And my collie was kind of, she has four legs, so it's a bit easier for her. She was scampering up in front of me, and the slate was just kind of coming down the hill, mountainside, to meet me. And I was absolutely terrified. But we got beyond that slate bit. And then at this one moment, I just kind of came up over this level, and there was a flat rock. And on that rock was this lump of quartz. Now, I've been told that this tumour, this cyst, was six to seven centimetres across. And this lump of quartz, which was quite out of place on that mountain, was about the same size. And it just felt like a gift. And so to add to the, the path is there even when you can't see it, the next thing was courage is rewarded with a gift. And so I thanked the land. And I knew somehow that that quartz stone was for me, and I put it in my rucksack. And I don't know if you know here, but it, it, the old people, the ancestors in Wales, they often used to use quartz and, and leave them as offerings. It's kind of a, a beautiful white glistening stone. And it's kind of a bit like you have sometimes, they, they sell them here, quartz necklaces. Well, this is the raw stuff. So it was really profound to find that. And we continued a little bit more, and from slate and scree, it just became a rock face. I didn't have any ropes with me, and it was, right, what do we do now? We can't go back down, because that means going down the, sl the scree slope, and it's like that. So I sat on this rock le ledge, looking down, and it was incredibly steep, and we'd seen nobody all morning. And I sat there thinking, that's it. It's over. I might well die here because I can't see a route up and I don't know how to go down. I'm a bit stuck. And with that, amazingly, this man appeared below me. And I said, do you know your way up? He said, yeah, follow me. I do this route about every week. I live near here. And so we followed him. And I was a bit worried about my collie because, as I said, she's got no thumbs to climb. But somehow, she managed to scramble up this one path. And we were a bit slower than him, and once he'd shown us where to go, it was okay. 
And we got to the top and he disappeared. There was no sign of him at all. And there is that lesson. Courage is rewarded with a gift and when you have need of it, the universe sends help. Help is always there if you can just look out for who is sent. And we got to the top and we sat down and life has never been sweeter. I don't know if any of you have ever been kind of at that point of thinking, I'm not sure if I'm going to live this through. But when you do, life seems just the sweetest, most amazing thing. It's such a life affirming thing to do. And Caddy the Collie and me, we sat at the top going, wow, we're alive. Isn't that amazing? And it kind of didn't matter that I had this thing inside me. I was alive and somehow I knew that the mountain had just taught me a number of really invaluable lessons that I needed to learn. That's what I mean about listening. When you slow down to the soul's pace, you can listen, you can hear these things, and you can pick up the lessons. And at the top, it, it, it was about May time and snow still hangs around and there was a patch of snow. So the first thing I did was kind of make a big heart and write the Welsh word for love. And I had in my, in, picked up on the route, on the lower slopes, some small bits of crystal. And at the top of the route, there were these um, Bronze Age burial cairns. One is called Carnedd David, David burial cairn. And the other was called Carnedd Llewellyn, Llewellyn's burial cairn. And they're big piles of stone, and there would be a burial underneath dating from the Bronze Age. And so I had this stone and I gave it back and I said to the ancestors of that place, thank you for keeping me safe. Thank you for the lessons that you've just taught me because that's so, so valuable. And then it became about the scramble down to the valley of the moon because that's why I'd come. That's what I'd come looking for. And it's really important to notice and appreciate the beauty along the way and to not put things off, to really engage. This the one picture is the, is the pathway down, kind of as we as we came down. It was just the most beautiful, beautiful wild place. And when I got down there, the sun just hit the lake and made this kind of path. And it just was saying, "Come on, come on, take your clothes off, come have a swim." It was quite a cold day. There was still snow on the mountains, but I'd had a good walk and I was sweaty and I was hot, so I stripped off and I went swimming towards that sun and it was most incredible life-affirming thing to do. So don't put those moments off. If, you th if you're looking at that lake thinking, I'd like to go for a swim, but I won't go now, I'll go another time. Go now, do it now. You know, go out into the wilderness near your homes. Go for a swim in the lake. Don't worry about being naked and things like that. It's about taking what life and wilderness offers you and doing it, finding your own boundaries and understanding that you can cope with much, much more than what you think. It's also in part about finding the mythos in life, the poetry in life. Now the Greeks thought that for humans to have a balanced life, they needed to understand that life operates in two ways. It operates on logos and logos is this is how it is, this is reality, this is the facts of life and you know the everyday grind, this is what it, real life is about. But also importantly, to support that and to support the human spirit, we need to engage with the mythos of life, the mythic in life, the poetry, the essence of it. Because if we're only dealing in the reality, we get burnt out pretty quickly. If we deal with the mythos of life, we can start to see the patterns in life. You know, when you look at what's happening in the world right now with Trump and all those kind of things, back in, in, in the UK where I come from, we've had some pretty bad kind of political things going on. And that can get you really down if you're just dealing in the, in the logos. If you start to look at the mythos and understand that there's context here, that human beings have always gone in a loop and that we've always had egomaniac leaders that eventually get toppled. 
can start to see a pattern, and you can start to see that it's part of a process that is going to change, and you can start to find a different way of looking at it. And the same is the same for that walk that I just shared with you. I could have just gone for a walk and struggled up a path, got to the top, then gone down to a lake, had a quick swim and gone home. But to enter the mythos of a process is to really engage with the magic, that which the universe is giving you. It's when you meet the universe halfway and the universe meets you and you can start to have a conversation with land and with creation itself. That's when things become magic. That's when you can live in the mythos and the rest of your reality can come into balance. You don't have to just be living in the, in the logs. Unfortunately, so many of us along the way in the Western world have been told, stop dreaming and grow up, get real. How many of you have been told that in some, some point of that? I know I have. I had a report when I was seven years old in school that said, would do really well if she dreamt less. And it's taken me almost kind of most of the rest of my life to realize that I'd do much better if I dream more. It's really, really important. If we look and listen deeply, we can learn again to read the landscape, to listen to the landscape. This land speaks. If we can just be close enough and quiet enough, it will tell us its stories. And we can leave a little bit of our story in it. Last year when I came here for Boom, I left a little piece of myself here and a little bit of this land lodged inside of me. And last night when I returned here, one of the first things I wanted to do was to reconnect with those pieces and say, hello, hello again, how are you doing? And it fed me. It was a really beautiful thing because a part of my memories is steeped in this land just as your memories are steeped in this land. And you will carry something of this land and its energy back with you and share that with the world. The more people who say that this is possible, the more people will believe it and will create a small, quiet, beautiful, walking, dreaming revolution. Because that's the ultimate truth. This is what indigenous people and traditional societies know the world over, but we have forgotten. The human soul is closer to the invisible things than it is to the visible things. And sometimes it's only when we slow down to a camel's pace or to our walking pace that we can truly remember that and begin to notice it. We're all so busy, working hard. We've made a culture, we've made a, a celebration of busyness and it needs to stop because it's, it's taking away our humanity. This is essentially what it's about. It's a lovely quote by, Sh by Shelley. Away, away from the men and towns to the wild woods and the downs, to the silent wilderness where the soul need not repress its music, lest it should not find an echo in another's mind. As much as walking together with friends is beautiful and really important, sometimes walking alone is really important too because Ultimately, we all have to walk alone in the journey of our life, too. And so there is something really beautiful, very uh, meditative about just walking on your own. And it can start with a very simple act of buying a map and having a look at a map and plotting a route and deciding that you could connect this really interesting looking place with another really interesting looking place. And maybe there's a story, it could be a holy well, it could be a sacred mountain, because most mountains were sacred at some point. This land is sacred, every land is sacred. And so when we walk on it, it becomes a sacred journey. Go out, do that, but don't forget to give back to the land, to acknowledge those moments of magic and to create rituals at the end to honor the journey that you've been on. Because the act of creating such a ritual, this is one, an example of one we did on one of our journeys. What we tend to do is ask people to collect little things along the way that, that 
the, 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 the land gives them, that kind of the universe puts across our path, just to pick them up and to associate a memory of that moment. What does that mean? And at the end, we create a shrine, we put them together. And usually we will leave those things in place. Most of them are biodegradable and they will just disappear into the earth. But it's a really beautiful thing to do, to just honour that journey that you've made, the processes that you've been through, to remind yourself about the thinking that's been going on, the dreaming that's been going on, the feeling that's been going on, and the magic that has been created. And to thank and acknowledge the ancestors that have left their imprint on those paths that you've just walked and to honour yourself for the memories that you've just left in the path and the future that you're creating for yourself. We need to make journeys. It's something about our humanity is to walk. And if we stop walking outside and wilding ourselves and pushing our boundaries and being playful, and opening our imagination to dreaming in the landscape, we are going to lose something fundamental about who we are. It's a radical act, going for a long walk. I hope that you will enjoy doing it. I hope that you'll go out, go find a map, and make that journey for yourself and for humanity as a whole. Thank you very much. Lex, I think we've got about a few minutes for some questions, if anybody's got questions. Yeah? Yeah, you do. Anybody got some questions? Thoughts, ideas? Uh, I have a question. Uh, what is a salt place? Oh, what is a what, sorry? Salt place. Salt place. Like a soul place. A song, a song place? Uh, I think it was song place. Song place, okay. So um, the, the idea of song lines comes down to us from uh, Aboriginal Australia. Um, Aboriginal Australians created paths long ago linking things and the way they remember the paths because they were, they, they, they have been until very recently um, hunter-gatherers and nomadic as we all would have been. The way they remember landscape and the way to cross vast, vast tracts of land is they have songs. They have songs that they teach the children. And those songs help them to navigate these huge areas of desert. They know how many places, they know what they're looking for, they know how to find water in those places just from the song. And when they get to those places, they do ceremony. So there are these kind of, um, there are these powerpoints in the landscape. The song will also tell them about the original ancestors, the creation, the creator beings of those places. So if it's a water creek, there will be maybe lizard, grandfather lizard will have created it. And so they will have that in their story song and they will honor grandfather lizard there either by dancing together or making offering or something like that. We have lost that in the Western world, but I still believe that those songs, what they call the song lines, which are these paths along, that connect important places, are here all across Europe. And it's about sometimes us looking at um, where the burial chambers are, where the sacred sites are, where the sacred wells are, and finding paths along them, intuiting, dreaming into that landscape, and we can find those again. So that's what the song lines come from. The question is, how can I find uh, mythological information or sacred information that is not misleading? Because recently on the internet especially, there's a lot of um, information that might be false or I don't know, how, how can I like really connect with what is true? The really interesting thing about mythology and story is because so much of it was born on the oral tradition for such a long time, we can't know what truth is. Okay. We're in mythos. 
So yes, I, I know that the internet isn't always a sure source, but it's a good place to start. And um, if there's a story associated with a place, even though maybe the, the details of the story aren't correct, it's telling you that there was a story to this place. And it's the beginning. And you can go there and you can... And then maybe the rest I'll just hear exactly. it out. Exactly, yeah. Okay. And you've got to remember that stories traditionally are handed down from storyteller to storyteller, or father, son, daughter, whoever. And each storyteller makes the story their own. So we can never know what the original story was. It's always changing. And that's right and proper because every story is, is, is created anew for our time now. So don't worry too much. If, there's, if it looks as if there's something interesting there, just go. Just go find it. Yeah, and I live next to the ocean, so it's a perfect place. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you so much. It was so interesting for me because I, I wrote my thesis on walking to Santiago. Oh, <laughs> great. You've done lots it. of research, yeah. Um, but my question is more personal. I was just wondering, um, because I also did research into this yeah, this moment what you talked about from, from when walking was just um, well, the, the act of walking on, until at some point we started to walk with a, with a purpose, more or like just to walk around. <laughs> Uh, and how is th is there a moment in your life that you remember uh, that you realized ah oh, now I'm really yeah connecting and I'm not just going from A to B that I'm in the nature or I'm in a certain place as yeah as this kind of therapy or this kind of connecting that you just talked about. Hindsight is a wonderful thing, isn't it? You sometimes <laughs> it it's not until you get to a certain point in your life that you can th see that there was a thread connecting all these things right back. I have a really early memory of being about seven years old and um, my cousins lived on a farm. It was the, the farm next door to where my father grew up and we would run around in the woods and I vividly remember running into this beautiful clearing of trees in the woods and just running, playing a game hide and seek or something and just stopping and a shaft of sunlight came in and I just remember being very still and sitting down and sensing that I was in the presence of something that was greater than myself and, and then it was gone but that was maybe my first um, the first moment that I can think of that I knew that there was something magical something really connecting spiritually for me um, p other people find it in different places, but for me, I, I knew that the kind of landscape was something that could trigger that. That I that I found, um, I found deity, if you like. I found s the spirit in those wild places. So it goes back as back as far as that. And I'm sure that you know, if we start to look, we, we can trace it back a, a long way. But it isn't until maybe you're you're older and you're thinking about it that you, you start to realise that. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Thank you. Um, listening to you speak brought back or raised lots of maybe different ideas or things that I've heard before or have had access to in some way or handed down. Um, and I was wondering if there's a particular way in which maybe the Welsh or being from Wales construct ideas of selfhood and the landscape and a relationship between those two things and if there's something you could say on that yeah I mean I, I think I'm very lucky if you like to have been I would say that would my lucky to be born Welsh but we have this ancient language that we is a Celtic language and probably was founded on the language that was spoken by the Neolithic people of Britain um, after the end of the last age and then the Celts came in and those languages fused and I can still read a piece of poetry from the 6th century in Welsh and, and understand it and that's a pretty deep thing and what's beautiful is that the, the stories, the, the memory of stories is kept in the place names in Wales so there's a valley called the Nantlet. Oh. 
uh, in North Wales, and the whole of the fourth branch of the Mabinogion, one of our great kind of mythological cycles, is set in there. And you have things like you have Caer Arianrod. Arianrod is one of the goddesses, and you can point to it, and you can visit it. You, know, you can visit it on on a boat because it's out at sea. Uh, Caer Lle, or, or um, the the fort where Lle is meant to have lived, one of the, the gods of the story, you can walk to it now today. And that's true of this whole 15 mile journey. Most of the story is plotted and is, is present there. So there is something about that. But what I would also say is we're all indigenous to the earth. You don't have to be indigenously Welsh to appreciate and to listen to the land in Wales. You don't have to be Aboriginal Australian to build a relationship with the land of Australia. Landscape doesn't really care, the earth doesn't really care about who you are or what your G DNA is. It just wants you to listen. It's there for everybody. Um, and But what I think those people can do as guides is to help to guide people back into their culture and give and, and give some guidances. It's like giving you a map, a cultural map, if you like, to help you to understand what was going on in that place. Does that help to answer your question? Okay, thank you. One more? Or maybe we're all done. If so, thank you very, very much for listening. Please go out, get a map. Go out and kind of be radical and just walk this landscape and, and you know, reappropriate it. Reappropriate the landscape and reappropriate the wildness in yourself. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, on her wing and find her in the morning at the sacred fire every morning at nine o'clock for a ritual. Ah oh, come on, one more applause. <laughs> Yeah, that's good. <laughs> yeah, that's our style. Thank you very much.